Beloved, you have arrived. Welcome to Women of Devotion, a free interview series featuring a diverse group of women who firm-footedly walk a path of devotion, inspired by the mystery that is life. Enjoy. Hello and welcome everyone to the Women of Devotion series. I'm your host, Luna Love, and I'm super just feeling really blessed to be here with all of you today and with our special guest, Myra Peñalosa. And before I introduce her, I just want to invite all of you to really give yourself permission to be fully present. So whatever you need to do that, take the time that you need to pause us and turn off the distractions and really give yourself the gift of allowing yourself to be moved by the women in this series and Myra, who we have here today. And the key word there is allowing. I'm excited to introduce our guest, Myra Peñalosa Mojar. Myra is a role model on how to live a creative life. She is an LA and Canada-based mother, educator, and fashion designer, helping women to experience their own true radiance, luminosity, and grace. She's the co-founder of It's Time to Bloom, a creative living festival in Canada, and creator of the Kundalini Gown, inspired by her Kundalini yoga practice and lineage. Myra is the founder of La Luna Social, a space for women to attune in communion. You can always find her at myrapinolosa.com, and we're so excited to have her here with us today. Welcome, Myra. Oh, thank you. Uh, Truly grateful for the invitation. Like, thank you so much for just plugging in and calling me forward and allowing me to share and it's truly a blessing to be here with you so thank you so much Luna love thank you <laughs> so I love to begin with a little grounding and blessing so if it feels good to everyone we can allow the eyes to close and find our feet and our seat and allow ourselves to just be held here in this now moment Inviting all the pieces of ourself to fully arrive, to be fully embodied within ourselves, and to be fully honored at this time. We acknowledge that we've been called forth for a very particular reason that is maybe known or still a mystery to us, and we commit to allowing this experience to unfold before us, to show us the way in which we can step into a greater embodiment of our true selves. And we acknowledge that this is a shared experience and that all of us are giving and receiving with our time and energy and presence. And we honor and connect with all the beings who are tuning in and participating in some way. And we acknowledge this with our breath. So fully and emptying the body of all the breath here. Taking a big, full, deep inhale, receiving all of the life around you and welcoming it all in, all of the people, all of the elements, feeling the fullness. And on your exhale, giving yourself back out to the world and to all of life, fully and completely not withholding any pieces of yourself. We come into this experience of commerce and exchange and sharing breath giving and receiving to one another as a way of expressing our gratitude for this shared experience of life and i'd love to invite myra to offer anything she feels called to at this time to open this space together Thank you for the invitation. Well, just in alignment with the devotion, I I invite everyone uh, to just connect to your matriarchal lineage, to the lineage of your ancestral mothering side of your humanosity. <laughs> of your self here and now. So what I love to do in terms 
of calling in the wisdom of my ancestors and opening up the portal so that I can speak in integrity and I can be in integrity, not only with myself, but with, with the past and moving forward in the trajectory of liberation and surrendering and softening. I invite us all to, you can even, it's just, if it feels right for you, just allow yourself to mentally vibrate the next following sequence of words that I'll share with you or to state them out loud in your own personal safe and sacred space. And the way that it goes is very simple. So just calling in your mother's energy and calling in your grandmother's energy so that they're here with you, listening and feeling the sacredness as we share woman to woman, womb to womb. <laughs> So I, I will set the tone by introducing my lineage. I'll inhale to begin. My name is Myra, mother of Soleil, daughter of Patricia, and granddaughter of Alicia. Thank you for being here. And then Luna, if you feel inspired, you can do the same. Thank you for this invitation. I am Luna, daughter of Rita Marie, and who is the daughter of Rosemary, who is the daughter of Lucille Marie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, so I'd love to begin if you could define the word, the meaning that you attribute to the word devotion. And we'll, we'll jump into what your personal path looks like, but I'm just curious on a sense of meaning making and how we all relate to the words that we use, how you relate to and would define this word of devotion? What comes to mind is God, you know? It's this kind of sacredness that has nothing to do with religion, because my religion is about reality. You know, how, how we move through reality and how we relate to others and how you see God in all, right? So devotion is kind of seeing the good, you know, for me, it's, it's, it comes down to the word God only because it's this connection to that co-creative energy that allows you to produce whatever you're producing in the sanctity or this sacredness of whatever you're delivering and sharing with, with the world, you know, and, and that truly for me is divine connection so devotion and god they they connect in this synergy for me within my experience of, of practicing a devotional practice is really allowing myself to become this this open vessel and and allowing god to come in you know it's, it's seeing the good, being the good. There's G-O-D within the good. And if God is too heavy for you to hear because of the, you know, the heaviness that it carries, right? Just break it down with that generating, organizing, and delivering energy, you know? So you're generating, you know, you're generating, you're setting your accoutrements for your devotional practice, right? Whether it be, you know, a portrait of your guru, whether it be a statue or a, a, a murti of, you know, any, any god or goddess, whether it be a sacred something that you hold up in your altered space, right, as your altar for that devotional practice, whatever it be, let that generate and organize the layout and then deliver the intentions or destroy them wherever you're going with it. There's many different facets and many different angles. But yeah, in a nutshell, devotion is God for me. Beautiful. I, it's a word that I, oh, I just, that's funny. I drank some matcha while you were talking and I had a little green on my, 
<laughs> my nose. Um, I love this generating, organizing, delivering. That is an ac- or like I always call it acronyms anagrams, which are different, but an acronym. Um, it's so it feels so good in my body. And the biggest thing that I took away from what you shared was the allowance to open, to, re- to let God in, to, to receive. I think the action piece or like the challenge or the, the choice or the commitment is really in that opening to welcome and allow God to move through us and for us to be those vessels. Um, to, to allow whatever wants to come through to come through. And one of the other words you used was the co-creating factor. And in my little window into your world through social media and just like feeling into who you are, creativity is such a big piece that allows, that seems to move and propel your life forward. And I'm curious where... Yeah, where devotion and creativity meet for you and what you birth or produce or allow to be birthed through you. And what is that? How do you see that that devotion and creativity in your life are related or not related? Oh, they are definitely doing a dance. (laughs) There's definitely, I feel like the devotion is, um, it's almost like the dance. Or devotion is like the platform and then creativity is, is the muse it's, it's the dancer that just moves around this beautiful dance floor and for me I feel in my personal experience is when I am not coming from a place of devotion <laughs> she can't access me muse can't come to me creativity is is blocked right there was a beautiful podcast that I listened to with um uh, the name of the author escapes me, but uh, she wrote the the book Big Magic. Elizabeth, oh goodness, Elizabeth Gilbert, Pray Love. Author. Yeah, Elizabeth Gilbert. Elizabeth I'm pretty Gilbert. sure that the podcast is also so. called Big Magic, but I could be wrong. And she was being interviewed by another person, oh okay woman. <sighs> yeah, it's a it's a great one. I'll share. I'll probably I'll find it and I'll share it with you in a later time. But um, she said something that was like, yes, that this is what it's about, um, is how ideas are kind of entities, right? And they're looking for a vessel to merge with so that the vessel being ourselves, the vessel can then produce that said idea. And when she was talking about that, that for me felt like creativity. Like, so creativity has its own identity. And if you're receptive enough, or open enough, or in alignment with your devotion, in alignment with your seva practice, right? Service, being of service, aligning with the generating, organizing, and delivering forces, then that creativity wants to merge with you and commune with you. And then you deliver said creativity in whatever form it comes to you. And then you step back from it. That's one thing that we, that I've seen in, in, in friendships and in partnerships is this wanting to control the idea after it's been birthed and, and kind of shape it and mold it and, 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 and put it into a specific you know, um, file or box or whatever, or genre. And my personal experience is allowing you to step back and let the thing self-conceptualize <laughs> because now it's become, it's become a form. Right? So, so the creativity is floating around us. It's this energetic, you know, entity of its own. So I'm going to use what, what Elizabeth says about ideas, but just kind of put them in creativity because that's how it landed for me. That's how I was, made, I was able to relate it in my personal experience. And let yourself be open. You know, let your meditation practice guide you into that softening and opening to, to, to those inspirational moments. And, and that kind of is the guidance to live in an inspired life. And as that creativity merges with you, then however, don't even worry about how, but just allow yourself 
to just feel the intention of the creativity and then set the intention forward and then watch watch things kind of pop up that will support with the alignment of producing that creativity through you as you as a conduit essentially and and then step back and give it room give it space to grow one of my teachers recently in in at yoga west kundalini yoga studio in vancouver his name is Hadi singh and he's like one of the old um uh teachers that um got the opportunity to teach with yogi bhajan he told me about parenting he said this is what yogi bhajan told me pay the rent and get out of the way <laughs> so essentially you know give them the space to just be who they want to be in terms of being a parent and you know mothering and being you know watching the child grow same thing with the creativity right birth it give it space and watch it watch it bloom watch it kind of take on its own shape and then gradually you can you can add imprints you can add you can build to it of course right because that's what we do as human beings we want to you know what I mean? Nurture the thing. So do that without trying to force things. I find that these these two dynamics of devotion and creativity are the solid foundation of living a creative life. So just finding a devotional practice and then being receptive, being open, allowing yourself to be a conduit of spirit to move through you as you so that you can deliver what needs to come and be delivered through you. And then sometimes you'll even feel, you know, inspired. And then for whatever reason, your, your, you know, the, the mental facets of the mind will come in and, you know, tell you you can't because of whatever your story. And then that creative entity, that creative energy will move on to someone else. And then you'll have a moment at least in my personal life, where it's like, oh, that was totally my idea. Is the government watching me? No, I'm kidding. But you know, that was like, oh, I totally, but it's because you weren't able to deliver. So the thing, the creativity needed to, to search for someone that could, that had all of the, the you know, the elemental tattvic forces to support it. So yeah, just trusting in yourself that you can, and then you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like that. And um, I've heard Elizabeth Gilbert speak a lot and the pieces of, of like, there's someone that she talks about who's a poet. And this poet says that these poems would come through her and they would be like, like a hurricane or wind force. And if you didn't catch it, if you didn't catch the poem, it would, it would go away. And so she would like, there was one that she would chase after. Um, and she was like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And and I love that because it's the thing that I come back to in, in what you're sharing is the allowing, right? It's, um, am I open to let this thing come through me at this time? Because if not, I'll find somebody else who, who's more open to let that muse co-create with them. I really liked what you shared. So I'm curious about, um, oh, this is also a side note. When I was getting dressed this morning, I had a, I had a client who came to my house and I was getting dressed and I just happened to be putting on like all black. And I was like, oh, this is funny. I'm meeting with Myra later. And she's like, I know that you wear lots of different colors, but you're the white, you know, the Kundalini gown is the white and all of it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. I was like, I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to just, oh, <laughs> there's a reason for it. That's perfect. I love it. Um, oh, it's the, it's the beauty and it's polarity right so we're just like holding those ends of the spectrum um i'm curious about your own path of devotion and so you mentioned kundalini and motherhood and i'm sure that your paths of devotion are are plenty plenty and i'm just curious if you could share with us like what that looks like in your life what it tastes like what it smells like what is devotion and how does it manifest in your personal life well, as of right now, we are at liberty. So my, my little family unit, we got, um, actually, this is kind of intention setting in the, in, 
in the making essentially because we've been wanting i'm just going to tell you a little bit about the background of where i'm at and then i'm going to answer your question <laughs> so we had intended to want to travel and we actually got kicked, not kicked out of our apartment but asked to leave our apartment because there was a gas leak in our furnace and it was quite toxic so we had already been planning to be away for a, for a few months and so we were kind of like right up you know right up against like we got to leave in like a week and now we have to like pack up our home and find a new home or you know put everything in storage and then maybe just float and go with the flow so we decided to do that we decided to put everything in storage pack up our tiny home sell half of our major big things that weren't going to take up too much storage space and um and we are currently on the road so we are very vulnerable there's a very vulnerable space that we're in energetically that's causing us to stretch beyond our um, comfort zone because both my husband and I are very earth grounded um, elemental beings. So we love our home space, very home bodies. We work from home. So this is definitely a stretch in the matrix for us. And with that said, it, it, it was, it was the, the, the outcome of our devotional practice that has led us to really untether from the attachments to our comfort zone. And we, it's coming to us, Bali's been kind of right at our right shoulder, like come to Bali, come to Bali. And so in terms of how devotion is manifesting for us right now is, is leading us to Bali. And I've never been to Bali, but you know, I, I, I read the Eat, Pray, Love book and it just moved my soul. And you know, I, I, I've watched the, the Bali retreats and the, the whole, you know, the whole thing. And I am finally, you know, picking up the call and like, okay, well, I guess the universe is pushing us out <laughs> so that we can make it there. And what I hear about Bali, which I'm sure you've heard, is the way that they treat their children. They treat their children as royalty, of like sovereignty, right? Because they're the closest thing to God, going back to this word. They're the closest thing to God because of their innocence and their curiosity. So innocence and curiosity, I feel, has been these two pillars of what allows the platform or the dance floor of devotion for us. And, or for me, only because I've seen it through my, my, my daughter. <laughs> I've seen it come through my daughter and seeing her innocence and her curiosity. She's, she's in her toddler phase. She's, she'll be two in a few months. And she is genuinely the most curious, the most fearless, the most willed, <laughs> and the most daring little soul that I've ever met in my whole life. And she brings that to me again and again and again. And she's kind of been my, my practice of devotion, my practice of prayer. Oh my goodness. And prayer. We didn't even get into prayer yet. <laughs> so this, this prayer, um, Yogi Bhajan says that a woman's prayer is the most powerful prayer sound vibration code on the planet. And I can get into more detail about that, but then that's a whole other podcast. So anyways. <laughs> so with that said, it's just, it kind of segues us back into that vibration. And my husband jokes because he says, you know, you always overpack. And I'm just like, well, you know, we're packing up our tiny home. I don't know what we're going to need on the road. But one thing that he really appreciates is our altar. Like we always, anywhere that we're staying, even if it's for a night, or even if it's just in this last trip that we've been on, even if it's, yeah, for a night, I always make it an intention for me. Even if I can't make it to my morning sadhana or make it to my yoga practice or make it on my mat. I make it a duty to lay out my altar with all my accoutrements of, you know, the, the photo of my guru, you know, the, fo the photo of my birth, just because that for me was the most divine experience of my life. And 
and all this beautiful layout. And that for me is what keeps bringing me back. Even if, because I said we're on this trip and it's very vulnerable and with vulnerability comes a lot of, a lot of, uh, of not fear, but sorry, not fear and <laughs> wanting to be helped you know, and, and, and the stress of communicating that wanting to be held, right? Because there's an expectation, you should be holding me, <laughs> you know, we haven't hugged today because we're trying to like get to the next place or, you know, meet, meet these friends or make it to this yoga class in this festival that we were just at. So it just allows you to kind of strip away or allows us, allows me to strip away all of the seemingly burdens of that moment and really just reset and align myself back to God, align myself back to my good, align myself back to the next journey of this adventure in terms of merging with creativity and merging with spirit and setting the tone for tomorrow. So that's kind of my devotion in manifestation is my nighttime ritual. You know, I sit at my altar and yeah, I, and if, and if the space allows, and if my daughter allows, tea, tea is truly an anchor for my devotional practice. And it's simple. It's so simple. And it's so sweet and it's so refined and it's so sovereign in its simplicity that the grace that you embody automatically leads you back to God. It's, it's beautiful. And I mean, maybe not everybody can relate to it the way that I have related to it, but this is just my personal journey with it as a scientist, right? As, as a human scientist, you know, in alignment with the humanology that is our humanosity. I love, I love what you showed. I went all over the place. <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's so perfect because I, Kundalini is so, I always, I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. This there, we're weaving a web. Um, Kundalini, as far as like within my body is something I'm very connected to, but as far as a lineage is something I'm so, not connected to oh yeah see <laughs> and so i have my own preconceived notions of the like complexity and just like all the the technology and all the teachings and and i love simple and so hearing from you that it's about creating a new beginning and finding a moment to start over by sitting at my altar and building this space and or being with this space and the simplicity of tea is so, not that I had any expectations of what you would share, but just so different than my relationship to how I perceive kundalini practice and lineage and like all the, all the things and, and the white and all of it. It's just like, it's so great. It's so interesting to like have this revealing experience in your share of, of like, I don't necessarily do all these things all the time. I don't necessarily get on my mat or do all the, the things. It's just creating a new beginning by sitting at my altar. The, the sitting at the altar allows all the other things to go away from the day and just be here and the tea. And we, we're going to be having tea and Balin on, um, on this series. So we'll get to talk about tea a lot more in another episode of this um, so I'm excited that you brought that up. Uh, just, just invoking her and, and the tea, the medicine of tea into the space and into whoever's lives have been or will be touched by, by tea. It's such a practice in my life and really, you know, grounds and centers me in my, in my day and my, my devotion. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. And when you were talking about, you couldn't see me um, when you were talking, but when you were talking about not you, but like the listeners couldn't see me when you were talking. But when you said the picture of your birth on your altar, like I just was like, <sighs> I had like the chills and the tears, and I it was just so moving to feel how 
that was a portal into a whole new becoming of a devotee, of someone who lived one life and was devoted to, to something. And, and in a way, how that changed as you crossed through that threshold. And I want to talk about prayer, but I also, because you just brought it up and prayer is like my jam, and I want to know what you have to say about it. But I'm also curious about this, the threshold of becoming a mother and what, how that changed or altered or affected your, your devotion. And you mentioned it, you know, and how you relate to her and how Soleil is this magical medicine being is teaching you all these, these things. But um, how did that change your devotion in stepping from one side of the portal of not being a mother to the other side of being a mother in a moment? That's, that's a loaded one, only because you don't realize, for me, I didn't realize how finite or how fleeting or how nonlinear time is until you are literally in a seva practice of taking care of another human. And my devotional practice before Soleil, so we, we, my husband and I, we were practicing conscious conception. We were ready for become parents. We not necessarily got our eggs or our ducks in a line because that's not physically possible. <laughs> but we we were just clearing out our um, our karmic weight heaviness and, and clearing out a lot of our karmic. I don't want to, well, karmic weight. Yeah, we're clearing it out, getting it out of our arc line, um, getting into our Akashic records energetically through the Kundalini yoga practice. So I was very devoted into healing my matriarchal lineage and allowing myself to become a conduit of this new spirit to come through me and also liberating him or her from the ancestral baggage. So that was my intention in becoming a mother was to just bring in a soul that is liberated from any karmic weight that isn't necessarily going to elevate and, you know, propel him or her into the leader of this new age. So that was when the Kundalini yoga practice was full on, like the last three years before getting pregnant, it was just morning, 4 a.m., Armat Vela, sadhana practice. And it's not as daunting as it sounds, because it was just a simple kriya. And it was the washing away of the karmic weight. And it was quite simple. It had a mantra to it. It has a mantra to it. It's not like it's not accessible anymore. It has a mantra to it. And it was wahe guru, wahe guru, wahe guru, wahe jiyo. And the, the kriya, or the mudra of the hands, was just washing away. So you're in this meditation, you're, you know, you tune in, you sit, and you can either, I didn't, you can move through your, you know, morning warm-up of the physical body. But for me, it was just, I would always be ready for it, and then I'd go back to sleep. And so I just would play it, but I would do it for 31 minutes. And wahe guru, wahe guru, wahe jiyo. And just over and over washing energetically as your hands are these bowls of water and just pouring it over the halo, the arc line, one of the 10 bodies in, in our humanology system. And that I feel really cleared the slate for us. So after I did that practice, that devotional practice, that sadhana, that really rich moving meditation, I then you know, it was almost like spirit came through and was like, I'm ready. And we, we, you know, we were out in Jasper and we were having the best time meeting our friends who live out there who own this amazing Ashtanga yoga center space there. And there we were, you know, inception happened and I stayed with the practice. I stayed with the practice. I, you know, chanted my, my mantra specifically through prenatal kundalini yoga practice. She came through. I had the birth that I wanted, like to the T. I mean, maybe not as long, <laughs> but to the T. And um, was um, the aftermath was kind of...
ashamed of because our birth was quite um, climactic and we were riding high for the first couple months and then there was a dip. There was the realization of this kind of mourning process, which, which I knew I thought I had done, but I did it too early because I didn't feel the weight of it. Like, oh, who am I now? I moved through this portal and now that was almost like this all whole other encompassing understanding of vulnerability where it's like your whole world is pulled from right under you and now you're forced to navigate in the dark of what works for you and I was I was blessed to have my mother at my birth but I was quite alone for for the months that followed because I didn't have my 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 you know my family to nurture and, and hold space for me because my husband and I were both living in Canada and his mother was there but we didn't really have that family dynamic yeah you have friends but friends and family like blood family is there's very, it's a very different ability to show up hopefully we can start to remove the veil of that <laughs> is my intention for the next trajectory of the 20 years that are ahead of us but um, it's a different level of showing up and it's a different level of understanding right so for us that was kind of energetically uh, tiring and very fatigued and, and, and finding a way to kind of um, cope and all the things that kind of brought me back to life would not necessarily feed my soul and the thought that like people would say, oh, you just need time alone. But the thought of being away from my daughter actually gave, brought up more anxiety. You know, like, no, I, just, I don't trust anybody was, was my thing. And um, so then that was kind of like a red flag for me. It was like, okay, all the other things that you did before aren't lighting you up. Okay, now you have to look at it from a different angle because you're looking at it from the lens that created the problem. So now you've got to clean the lens or switch, switch the filter. <laughs> so I was able to kind of just move and, um, and really get into prayer and ask, what do I need to do? You know, how, how do I need support and how that's going to show up for me? And am I truly available and open enough to receive that support? That was kind of my, 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 my density my block was, hmm, you know, cause that would mean that I'm not only putting them in my field, but I'm putting them in my daughter's field, you know, and then how trusting am I at that? So I just needed to get out of my own way because I was really coming from here and not really coming, well, here, as if they can see, from my mental space versus my heart space. So I needed to just readjust that and come back to my heart space and, you know, by the grace of God, I have a very beautiful, soft, you know, really in touch with this feminine side husband who caught it all and was able to see that before I could even really pin it. <laughs> and, and we were really proactive in like doing the things that we needed to do for me to reset and access this, access my heart. So now I have another meditation Kriya that I've been doing and it's Subhag Kriya. So Subhag Kriya is only nine minutes. So I'll do that whenever I can. It's not, um, I'm not very uh, strict on myself only because a few years ago we had the opportunity to host Marianne Williamson at our Bloom Festival in Edmonton and she said something before we were pregnant oh no, yeah before we were pregnant that just held a very refined resonance in my in my field and she said you know there was a there was a question and a conversation in her in her talk and she said something in relation to like you know as parents what would you suggest and she said for the next five years, you're exempt from any practice. Your spiritual practice, your spiritual alchemy, your spiritual substance is being a parent, is being a mother. So I really resonated with that. And I hold that specific um, prescription. I hold it near and dear to myself. So I, I don't make myself wrong for not making it to yoga. I don't make myself wrong for, you know, having my moments, I'm navigating again through, through a dark room of, you know, finding myself and, 
finding myself in relationship to my daughter who's now developing this second chakra that is very much in alignment of you know what's mine and what's you know everything's hers actually <laughs> mine 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 so just you know being able to navigate through her and then um the beauty in again the 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 relationship that my husband and I have is that he knows when I need to go and do my kundalini practice and he'll just come up to me and he's like babe maybe go to your sadhana <laughs> and then he'll take soleil and goes on a little journey and I'm like great and this last month that we were in Vancouver I got to you know go to sadhana go to a sangit where i wasn't just doing my own home practice at home alone but i was in a communal space which for me just pushes me to to to, to stay in the intensity of the stamina building of whatever kriya and you know the energetic space in the room just holds me up and then i'm able to kind of fill my cup so that i can lead and teach the workshops that I deliver and, and hold space for what I'm offering. So I got really filled up. So I, I, we had a really blessed month. <laughs> and in Edmonton, where we were living before, there wasn't much of, yeah, there wasn't much of a sangit for me to access. So I was kind of holding that space. And yes, I would practice with my teachers online on Rama TV, but it's, it's different from being in a physical space. For sure. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you shared. I'm personally in a very intentional preconception phase, which has been about a year and will probably be about another year or whatever it wants to be until that is made very clear. But it's really nice to hear how you use that time and, and the prayers that came forward and the practice that supported you and the ancestral practice and um yeah it's the preparation mind body spirit home space that is like really welcoming but but not just it's the for me it's like the acknowledgement of how profound the welcoming is and that you're really honoring the profundity of it by devoting yourself to this practice and so it creates this whole relationship before there's a physical relationship with the child and it's just really beautiful and and the grieving piece that you brought up of like who am i now and who was i and and that's lost and that's gone and how do i grieve it and the practice that supported you in in honoring that with every birth there is a death and to allow that which has died to to be dignified in its in its time and its life and it's giving to you and of you and that which you were. So grief is a big thing that I navigate and play with and is a big piece of my medicine. So I'm so glad that you brought it up in in your own sharing of, of becoming a mother because there is also an unbecoming too. So I'd love to close with a few words from you about prayer and anything else that you wanna share with the audience on their path of devotion? Mm -hmm. Prayer, prayer is kind of my hidden tool. <laughs> it's my hidden weapon, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, it is, right? 50% of the time when we're kidding, we're actually, it's really true. <laughs> so prayer, yeah, it's, it's, not, not the side of it is that when we usually go to prayer is when we're at our lowest lows. And I, I, I feel like if I can inspire your audience or if I can inspire, you know, if I can, if I can be a conduit of inspiration would be, you know, pray for prayer's sake, you know? And, and what, I, what I mean by that is kind of like create for creation's sake. You know, do art for art's sake, in a sense, because when you pray, it's similar to gratitude. When you're grateful for your environment, when you're grateful for who you are in the moment, or who you're becoming, or, you know, the excitement, you're grateful for the excitement of the, you know, unfoldment of such and such and such projects. It makes you present. 
It makes you present to the present of this moment. And with me and my experience, prayer is very much like that in terms of the sensation that you get, in terms of the awakening moment that you get. Because yeah, you can pray for, for where you need support, but if you can just hold, you know, hold a vision in your heart and, and pray for that vision, you know, and, and pray for that outcome, not just for you, but for the good of, you know, the environment or the community that it will trigger out into, right? Because if you hold a vibrational prayer, and prayer is similar to mantra, if you hold a vibrational prayer in your own personal sound system, so your own personal inner sound, then you're a walking, you're a walking conduit of inspiration, of enlightenment, of insight, of light. And you know, whether you're wearing white or not, people are gonna feel that and they're gonna look right at you and not know why. But they're gonna look at you and notice you come into a room and you, I might even say that you can even command the room with that prayer that you're vibrating with your inner mind's voice, with your inner mind's vibration. And it's, it's pretty profound and I've proven it right again and again. And it's, and it's something that you can walk away with and try to prove it wrong, you know, as the scientists that we all are. Try to see if, you know, is this right? You know, if I'm just in prayer with the thing, you know, meet the thing and then the thing will show up or, or whatever the thing. So just, you know, see, see if it works, see how, how it moves through you, see how it will open up spaces for you. It's, it's a profound tool, and I really encourage us to connect more to prayer. And when I say prayer, also, I don't mean, you know, praying, like praying to, to something. But, you know, and if you're having a hard time with that in terms of, like, praying to God or, if, you know, if atheist is your practice, even if even an atheist believes that there is, you know, a, a, a more elevated or more transformational personal stuff, right? So, so use that, use your, your you know, the, 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 the you in the future that is, you know, above the you in the now, essentially. <laughs> so be exalted. You. Be exalted. So yeah, that would be my take away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for being here with us today. It's been such a pleasure to have your presence and your voice and your story and your practice and your devotion here with us to, to be shared. It's an honor. And I am so grateful for, for you just saying yes and, and sharing yourself in that way with us today. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for holding the space for women as a tool to you know, be inspired, feel supported, and feeling connected. It's so important. So thank you for holding that space for, for everyone. Thank you. And to everyone who tuned in and listened, thank you for being here. You can check out Myra at MyraPenyalosa.com and on Instagram. And um, super blessed to have you here. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>